I I love wrestling. We've talked about this before. I just love uh, professional wrestling. I love the, the theater because it's it's a soap opera. It's a soap opera with really bad acting and over exaggerated characters, and I love that. It's my stories. You know, it's just what I watch when I don't want to think about anything. I love the, the, the good versus evil. You know, if you watch long enough, the good guy will always win. And I love the performance, the, the athletic maneuvers and, and the athletic performance that they, that they do when in the wrestling ring is, is so impressive to me. I've been told that it is a predetermined contest. Okay, so you don't, you're not telling me anything new. You know, you know that ain't real, right? Okay, yeah, thanks. Um, <laughs> it's a predetermined contest. But it is, you know that movie that you just paid $15 to see? Uh, that was predetermined as well. I hate them now. Now we're even. Okay? <laughs> but I just, I've always, I've always loved the theater surrounding professional wrestling. And it's not too much of a stretch to find wrestling all throughout scripture because it is a common condition that we find ourselves in. We are always struggling or wrestling with something. It might be a relationship, it might be a decision, or it might just simply be your place that you find yourself in life in that moment. You may be wrestling with something. So we're going to look at a, at a few biblical characters, a few people that existed, and kind of see their struggle. But everything kind of revolves around one verse out of Ephesians, one that you might be familiar with. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12 tells us we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. So this verse reminds us that right now there is a battle that is constantly going on. There is a force of good, there is a force of evil. And that war is constantly waging, and just by virtue of your existence, you're a part of it. You're a part of the match. You are a part of this battle between good and evil. And we, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. What that means is you think you have a beef with your mother-in-law. You think you and your spouse aren't getting along. You think you and your kids or you and your coworker aren't getting along. And, and it really doesn't have anything to do with that. In fact, we're kind of told we're kind of wasting our time if you're fighting those battles. Because the real battle is what is good what is evil, and those forces are always in conflict with one another. They wrestle. And we do not wrestle with, with flesh and blood. There's, there's futility in that. We wrestle against this battle that we're all in, which is a battle between good and evil. Today we're going to talk about the ladder match. Now, if you've never watched professional wrestling, I feel sorry for you, it's awesome, but if you've never watched professional wrestling, there's a couple ways that you can win. You can pin your sh opponent's shoulders to the mat for a count of one, two, three. three. Okay, some of you have watched John Towns first. You can knock your opponent out where they can't answer a ten count, similar to like boxing. Um, or you can make them submit. They can give up. They can cry uncle. They can pack out. But in a ladder match, that is not the goal. In a ladder match, opponents engage in battle. And the idea is to incapacitate your opponent so they cannot stop you because you need to set up a ladder and climb it to reach a goal. The goal might be a championship belt of some sort. The goal might be a briefcase that contains something that, that the competitors want, like a special contract or something. But they have to climb the ladder to get the goal. I've got a couple pictures here. This is what a ladder match looks like if you've never seen one. There he's climbing to, to get, his, get his championship belt. Sometimes in the midst of battle, the ladder gets used uh, as a weapon, or uh, the second picture here, sometimes they will launch themselves off of it and land on their opponent, or um, land on the ring or the floor, or something that gets between them and their final destination. Coincidentally, uh, that is Shawn Michaels, uh, and that ladder match was WrestleMania 10, quite possibly the greatest ladder match of all time. <laughs> if you agree, say amen. <laughs> All right. So, so that's how a ladder match works. So we're going to look at a, at a ladder match. In the next of uh, but first, I have to give you a little bit of recap because one of the first people we're going to talk about is a man by the name of Jacob. Okay. Now, in September of 2017, I told you about the life of Jacob up to the point that we're going to talk about today. So everybody, pull.
pull out your notes from September 2017 uh, so that you can follow along with the recap. One person, I've got them. Okay. She brought me an apple earlier today, too. <laughs> so just a, a recap on the story of Jacob. Now, when I say Jacob, uh, many of you may be familiar with the story. There was a famous wrestling match in the Bible where Jacob wrestled the angel, Jacob wrestled God. And we're actually going to talk about that story next week. So come back because okay, that's important. Um, but that was not Jacob's first wrestling match. If you read about a dozen chapters in Genesis, uh, you'll read about this promise that God made to a man named Abram who would become Abram. He promised him that he was going to be the father of many nations and that through his family the entire world would be blessed. And this promise that started with Abraham, we don't know why God picked Abraham, but that's how it started. Uh, Abraham had a son named Isaac. Uh, the promise continued, and Isaac had two sons uh, by the name of Jacob and Esau. Esau. So some of you were here in September 2017. Uh, but Jacob wrestling God, which we'll talk about uh, in a few chapters next week, was not the first wrestling match because the Bible tells us that when Rebecca, that's Isaac's wife, when she was pregnant with Jacob and Esau, they were twin boys, uh, the Bible tells us that the children struggled within her. The children wrestled in the womb. And she, they actually wrestled to the point and jostled about in her womb to where she asked God about it. Anybody ever carried twins? Anybody ever carried one child that feels like they're wrestling with like your liver or your spleen? Um, one guy in the back raised his hand. That's weird. Um, <laughs> but they were, they were so contentious in the womb together. That, that Rebecca prayed and asked about it, and God told her that there are two countries in your womb. Your, your children are going to represent two countries, and this is strange. This is counter to the culture. Uh, it's actually your oldest son who's going to serve your youngest son. And that was very strange, because in, this, in that culture, and to a certain point in this culture, you know, the firstborn, there's certain privilege that came with that, and uh, God said that it's actually going to be the other way around in this relationship. So the boys start to start to grow up and grow into themselves. Uh, Esau was born, the Bible says, with a hairy cloak. Okay, he was a hairy sword. He had red hair all over his body. And uh, he was an avid hunter. He was an outdoorsman. Uh, Jacob uh, was uh, a mama's boy, for lack of a better word. He was the interior sword. He helped him with the cooking. He had a Pinterest account. You know, the whole deal. <laughs> <laughs> and so the, 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 the brothers didn't have a lot of time. And one day, Jacob, when Esau was at his lowest point, Esau was just hungry and, and, and hopeless, uh, Jacob swindled or tricked or bargained Esau out of Esau's birthright. Birthright was the thing where, you know, I'm the oldest, I get more inheritance, I'm in charge of family, the whole deal. He actually bargained for, like, for a bowl of soup. You know, he, he bargained the birthright away from Esau. But that was only part of the swindle. You couldn't just bargain the birthright. He actually also swindled the blessing from their father, Isaac. He had to trick his father to give them the blessing. So just like that, with a little bit of deceit, a little bit of treachery, Jacob was now blessed and had the birthright. He was going to get the most stuff. He was going to be in charge of the family. Jacob's name actually means supplanter, or that's translated as like deceiver or liar. So he was, he was looking into his identity. The Bible says that he was... He was born gripping Esau's heel, always reaching for power from birth. And as you would expect to happen, when Jacob swindles Esau out of his birthright, swindles Isaac out of the blessing, Esau was upset. In fact, the Bible tells us that uh, Esau kind of has a conversation with himself and says, the days of mourning for my father are approaching. That means dad's going to die soon. And, and when that happens, I will kill my brother Jacob. And as Jacob uh, was a bit of an interior sort, and Esau was a big, burly hunter, if Esau wanted to kill Jacob, Esau would kill Jacob. That's how that would go. So Rebecca tells Jacob, you got to get out of town. we got family in another part. You just need to go head that way because Esau wants to kill you. And if he wants to kill you, if he's Esau, he will kill you. So sends Jacob away, essentially running for his life. So now you're caught up with Everything through Genesis 26. We find Jacob, this is where we're going to pick up the story. He's running for his life. He's looking for, for family, so he'll have somewhere to stay. 
And I'm going to start reading, if you want to follow along, Genesis chapter 28, verse 10. It says, Jacob left Beersheba and went to Haran, and he came to a certain place and stayed there that night, because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones of the place, he put it under his head and lay down in that place to sleep. So you would never travel at night. It was too risky. They didn't have Coleman lanterns. The bandits would have gotten you. The animals would have gotten you. So he's stopping through the night. And he's resting with his head on a stone pillow. I understand this is, this is kind of just a, a look at how things are going for Jacob at this point. Uh, no one chooses to sleep on a stone pillow. Okay, that was because there was no other options. That was because I'm out in the middle of nowhere, it's a rocky terrain, and I can either sleep flat with my head all dangling, or I can prop it up on a rock. So he is running for his life. He is alone. He is sleeping on a stone pillow. Verse 12 says, And he dreamed, and behold, there was a ladder set up on the earth. The top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. It's a very famous verse, a very famous story, because many of you have heard of Jacob's ladder, right? That's just where this comes from. So he has this dream, and he sees a ladder. Some of your translations may say, uh, uh, he sees a ladder, and it's one uh, end is connected to the earth, one end is connected to the heavens. And he sees, he's given uh, spiritual eyes for a moment in this dream. And, you know, if we had spiritual eyes, oftentimes we could see uh, some of the conflict that was going around us, because there's always a conflict with them good and evil and angels, you know, doing God's bidding on our behalf and forces of evil. And Jacob is given this series of lives, and he sees this ladder connecting heaven and earth, and angels going up and down. And it's this, there's a lot of mystery to this story. I mean, it's a dream, and, you know, it, it's in such a, it happens in such a unique way. Uh, but there is one specific reminder in this story, and that is this reminder that Jacob certainly needed, and we need and that is that God is involved. God is involved specifically in your life. Because I guarantee you when you are running from your life, regardless of if it was for your fault as it was for Jacob, or for no fault of your own, and if you're in the wilderness and if you are by yourself, and if you are sleeping in, on the floor, you probably do not perceive God being very involved in your life. But it's this reminder that, that God is involved in his life, because he sees the work of God happening. Now, this is important for us, but it would have been particularly interesting for him. In secular history, uh, in this culture, in this time period, uh, this was in the uh, Mesopotamian area. And in this time period, the Mesopotamian culture would have utilized something that we have remnants of now, uh, something called a ziggurat. We have kind of a, an artist representation of a ziggurat. Uh, what they would do based on their faith is people would build very large structures and they would get them as high as they could possibly get them. And then at the top they would put something, uh, polished metal or stone or something shiny, preferably blue, that would kind of disappear into the sky. And the idea was whatever god you worshipped or whatever deity that you, that you worshipped, if you got high enough and if you got close enough, they just might come down and interact with you. They just might come down and be involved in your life in some way. And so a, a ziggurat would have been very uh, familiar in this area. It would have kind of been most people's understanding of how God, even the Hebrew God, how God worked. Uh, many people speculate that the Tower of Babel that's mentioned earlier in Genesis, that would have been perhaps one of the first instances of a ziggurat because they wanted to build something to where they, they didn't need to depend on God coming to them. They could, they could figure it out. We could make a name for ourselves, and we could get a lot higher on our own. So Jacob's given this reminder that that's not how it works at all. That, that, that there are angels, and God's work is ascending and descending, and, and specifically involved in what you have going on. So this is his vision of this ladder. In verse 13, it says, Behold, the Lord stood above him and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father. God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give to you, and to your offspring. Your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth, and you shall spread abroad to the west, and to the east, and to the north, and to the south. And in you and your offspring shall be all the families of the earth be blessed. 
Verse 15 says, Behold, I am with you, and I will keep you wherever you go, and will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised. <laughs> so that promise sounds familiar. It was very, it was very uh, close to the promise that God made to Abraham. That promise kind of transferred to Isaac, and now God is, is making that promise. Hey, this is still real. It was real for your grandfather Abraham. It was real for your dad Isaac. And, and this is a promise that I'm making to you. Why did God pick Abraham, Isaac, Jacob? We don't know. But he made them a promise. And he was being very specific about his promise. Verse 16 <coughs> says, Jacob woke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place. And I did not know it. Now this, this had to be kind of a very sobering notion for Jacob. And to me, this is a very sober notion for, for you and I today. Because we are in a lot of situations, and I never want to step away from a situation, a situation in church, a situation in worship, a situation in Bible study. And you walk away and you think, you know what? God is there. I missed it. God was there, and I was so confused, I was so wrapped up in my own stuff. I missed it. Because the reality that Jacob kind of reminded himself is that God is present, whether you realize it or not. That the God has promised when we draw near to him, he draws near to us. That's a promise. Now, what are we missing? What are we missing when we walk away and say, man, shoot, God was there. You ever been in a church service and like the music's just not your thing? The preacher's just not your thing? The person sitting next to you just isn't your thing? And you're all going like, man, I did not get anything from that service. And you're maybe milling around in the coffee area and somebody's talking about how great the worship was and, and how the sermon spoke to them directly and how they made so many friends or whatever the case may be. And it's like, what did I miss? And oftentimes we miss out on God's presence because we, we get hung up on our own stuff or we try to worship at the idol of our own preference. You know, that, that is a, pre your preferences can be an idol. Where it's like, unless things are exactly right, that's, let me tell you when God shows up. It's during the, mid it's during the middle of this one song. Okay? And it has to be sung just right. And when we say, Holy Spirit, you're welcome here for the fourth time, boom, right through the door. That's when God shows up. Anything short of that doesn't happen. That's an extreme example. But it's true. We bow to God as our preference to where we, we don't expect God's presence unless we set the table. The reality is when we do as God says and when we draw near that He is present. The song that they shared with us, no matter where you are, no matter where you go, you don't escape this. I went. Verse 17. It says he was afraid and said, How awesome is this place? There is none other than the house of God. This gave heaven. Verse 18 and 19. So early in the morning, Jacob took the stone that he had put under his head and set it up for a pillar and poured oil on top of it. He called the name of that place Bethel, but the name of the city was Luz at first. This is cool. Uh, oil and anointing was just this, this kind of process that they went through that consecrated something. It made it special. It made it significant. Something extremely significant had happened. And then he consecrated or anointed what had been his stone pillow, what had been the representation of, wow, I'm alone and I'm sleeping on a rock. And now it was anointed, it was consecrated. It was a representation. This is going to be a pillar of Bethel. And the name Bethel means house of God. The name Beth anything means house of something. Uh, and Bethel means house of God. Bethany means house of pigs. This is right here. But, um, <laughs> Bible trivia for it. But he, he renames the place Bethel, House of God. And the original name of the place, Luz, means separation. So Jacob found himself both figuratively and literally in this place of separation. And then God reminds him, you know what, I'm, I'm, I'm in this. I'm involved in this. And you know what, I'm present in this whether you realize it or not. And he changes the name of the place. This can't be called a place of separation anymore. This Verse 20. Jacob made a vow saying that God be with me and will keep me in this way that I go. 
and will give me bread to eat, clothing to wear, so that I come again to my father's house in peace. Then the Lord shall be my God. And this stone, which I have set up for a pillar, shall be God's house. And all that you give me, I will give a full tenth to you. So this is, this is cool. This is before Moses. This is before the law, the commandments, Leviticus. Uh, tithing really hadn't been commanded at this point. It's on the second time in Scripture that tithing is even mentioned. Abraham, uh, Jacob's grandfather, uh, gives a tithe to the priest Mechizedek. And then Jacob makes this proclamation and ends up with, you know what? A tenth off the top is going back to God. And the language here is a little fuzzy because it, it kind of even sounds like you know, Jacob still had some growth to do. And it sounds like maybe there was still that just twinge of power grabbing, that, that twinge of bargaining, like, you know, if God does this, if God does this, I'm going to do that, I'm going to do this. Um, some scholars even say that a better translation is actually the word since, you know, since God did this, since God did this, I'm going to do that. Um, it doesn't change the meaning. Because the, the meaning for you and I, and the reality for you and I, is that response is required. Response is required. And that's an if response, a sense response, a because response. Since God did this, I'm going to do this. Because God did this, I'm going to do this. If God does this, I'm going to do this. But when God shows up, when God reminds us of his presence, when God reminds us that he is intimately, intricately, and specifically involved in our lives, we have to respond. Jacob's response was to finally make it personal. You know, it, it would be very easy. When your granddad is Abraham, father Abraham, and your father is Isaac, it would be very easy to lean onto the faith of your father, to lean into the faith of your grandfather. And Jacob kind of makes this proclamation and says, you know what, that was good for me for a while, but this is now my promise. This is my commitment. This is my proclamation. So a response is always required. There's a really special, a really unique tie-in, a New Testament tie-in in the story. This is how we're going to kind of wrap up. When Jesus was recruiting his disciples, we looked at, we looked at that a few weeks back, and he's talking to Philip, and he's talking to Nathaniel, and Nathaniel makes this, this proclamation about Jesus and proclaims him to be the Son of God. Uh, Jesus responds to Nathaniel and basically says, because you believe that, because you proclaim that, something is going to happen. It's in John 1, 51. It says, he said to him, Jesus said to Nathaniel, truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Very, very peculiar language there. If we look at these verses side by side, in Genesis there's a ladder. It's a dream of a ladder. It's the angels descending and ascending on each side. Jesus says, you're going to see that too. You're going to see angels ascending and descending on each side on the Son of Man. So Jacob gets this reminder, the ladder, which reminds him that there is a connection to heaven between God and man. And a reminder that God is involved in his life. That we have that. Jesus is our connection to heaven. Jesus is our reminder that God is specifically involved in our life. Jesus is now the lamb. It's that thing that we celebrate at Christmas time. That God thought enough of us to be involved in our lives. That God thought enough of us to step into the flesh, step into humanity, so that he could specifically and individually affect our lives. Jesus became the lamb that connects you and I, the God that connects you and I to heaven, that connects you and I to eternity. One more thing about a ladder match. Two opponents fight. It would be ludicrous to walk into a ladder match and body slam the ladder. Or punch the ladder. Or kick the ladder. Because the ladder is your means to victory. Don't fight with the ladder. Jesus Christ is our means to victory. Jesus Christ is our means to eternity. Yet oftentimes we fight the latter. Here's what I mean by that. The original promise, promise made to Abraham. He'll be the father of many nations. He and his wife Sarah were very old. It didn't make a lot of sense. But Sarah had a plan. Why well, can make this happen? 
I know God promised it to us, but I can make it happen. So she gives Abraham her servant, Hagar. And Abraham and Hagar have a son together by the name of Ishmael. But God promised Abraham and Sarah that they would have a son. And they did. So we mentioned before that Abraham is kind of the cornerstone of, of a couple of different faiths systems. He's the cornerstone of Judaism. By proxy, he is then the cornerstone of Christianity. He is also the cornerstone of the Muslim faith. Because the Muslim faith traces their ancestry back to Abraham and Ishmael. They consider Ishmael to be the promised son. So if you think sometimes that you know, God has a way, or God has made a promise, and I could probably strong arm that into happening, or I could kind of make that happen on my own, and think it doesn't have consequences, turn on the news. They went outside of God's promises, and thousands of years later, there's still conflict. We're still fighting for that. Sometimes we just we fight with the latter. We've been given a way, we've been given a means to victory and a means to eternal life. And Jesus just says, this, this is the way. This is the way you do things. This is the way you live your life. Do what I model, do what I teach. You say, no, I've got a better way. I've got an easier way. I've got a quicker way. And we fight with the latter. The latter is our means to victory. Jesus Christ is our means to eternity. The song we're going to close with today is familiar to most of us. And one of the verses says, My sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious law, my sin not in part, but in hope, was nailed to the cross. We bear it no more. Says, so hope still that Satan should bum it, the trial should come. Let this be our blessed assurance that Christ has regarded our helpless estate. God looked down and said, They need a way, they need a ladder, they need someone that reminds them that I am specifically and intimately involved in their lives, that my presence is promised to them and delivered to them. And that's what Jesus did for us. So don't fight with the ladder. You may have come in here with lots of different conflicts and lots of different things going on. And perhaps you need to weigh your life against the first verse that you read. What, what are you wrestling with? Are you, are you wrestling with flesh and blood or are, are you wrestling with this, this cosmic battle of, of good and evil and you're actually wrestling with your means to victory? You're actually wrestling with your means to eternity. So as we stand and sing today, uh, our altars are open for prayer. If anyone has a prayer need, they'd like to pray with someone. Our, our pastors are always available. Our deacons are always available. You can do that now in the service. You can do it after the service. You can do it at any time. But don't leave this place still wrestling with the lab. Don't leave this place still wrestling with Jesus Christ and what that means for you personally. Jacob could not lean on the faith of his father or his grandfather. Jacob had to make a proclamation and a declaration. But this is real. This is real for me.